Well, it has been a while. Uh, hi. Um, I, I woke up this morning. I checked my email. And I got an email from Spitfire Audio saying that my download was ready for Abbey Road 1. Uh, for those of you that know me, I'm a bit of an orchestral template nerd. And I spend probably more time tweaking my template than I do actually writing music. What I mean by that is that I will spend hours, days, months, actually years now, comparing my samples to my favorite recordings. My favorite recordings usually are, are from uh, Abbey Road in Studio One, surprisingly. Um, I also love recordings from Air, but Abbey Road One's always been my preference because I've always felt like recordings there have so much depth and dimension without getting soupy and uh, muddy, if you know what I mean. And I, I, I don't know a lot about the two rooms, but that's what the difference feels like to my ears. So I immediately pre-ordered this before I even heard any demos because I've been wanting some samples from this space for so long. I have modeled all of my instruments to try and pretend to sound like they're from this space. Uh, to varying degrees of effectiveness. But uh, as soon as I downloaded this, I couldn't help but give it a play. Now, the reason why I'm making this video is is that I'm actually kind of blown away by how good this library sounds. Uh, so I thought I might just do a little quick walkthrough with you. Really rough, really war raw, <laughs> case in point. Uh, and, and just give you my initial thoughts and why I was motivated enough to make a video about this. Now, I own a lot of, you know, libraries from Spitfire, but to be honest, not a lot of them in the past have made it into my template for varying reasons. I, I use a lot of their percussion and their harp and things like that. But I think that's about to change a little bit with this Abbey Road stuff. Uh, and I'm actually insanely excited to see what comes next because I feel like this is the teaser for for this space, for the recordings in this space. So, all right. Firstly, let's just load up something. I'm going to go brass trumpets. Uh, and one of the tests that I always use first when I'm testing a new brass library is what do their trumpet st staccatos sound like? Usually, they're a bit they're a bit interesting. Um, now you're going to have to excuse my playing because I'm using a, just a cheap keyboard up here and the velocity is, uh, is a bit weird and, but ergonomically it feels great to me. That's why I'm using this. Also, uh, for people who have followed me for a while, you might see that I'm experimenting with Studio One at the moment. Don't worry, I'm still a Cubase fanboy, but I like to explore different, different things here and there. Straight away, I cannot, I cannot help but smile when I hear that. Couple of reasons. Number one, there seems to be a lot of dynamics in these recordings. Uh, one of the biggest problems that I have with sample libraries in the past is they would kind of sound alright, but you would, uh, as you started going through the dynamics, you would hear a distinct jump where the buzziness of the brass would just come in out of nowhere. Whereas the bright brassiness of this is coming in gradually. And it sounds great. Uh, that's fantastic. Particularly in the lower dynamics. And it's still tight. The shorts are still really tight. They're not sloppy and long. I can tell these are very, very usable. I'm immediately going to be replacing all of my brass, uh, my trumpet shorts with this patch <laughs> straight away. The other thing is immediately, usually with sample libraries, I hear frequencies, resonances that I want to start immediately carving out. And I'm, I won't show you, but on, on all the libraries that I have, I usually have some very crazy EQs going on, usually with some dynamic bands in Pro-Q3 as well to try and control resonances and open the sound up a bit more. This just sounds like it does in a lot of my favorite recordings, ones that I've spent ages trying to match in a lot of my other libraries. I'm literally playing this out of the box using 
Mix One by Simon Rhodes, which, by the way, I think is a very clever, clever move by Spitfire. Um, you've got one of the world's top engineers in the top room, and I'm sure he's doing the exact same thing as what he did for his scores, and it's no surprise to me that it sounds like it does in in the scores. Which, well, well, to be honest, it is a surprise to me because somehow, I don't know how, but this has always been a mystery to me. Quite often, it doesn't sound anything like it does in our favorite scores. But this Abbey Road 1, everything that I've tried so far, I can't help but smile because it does. Uh, all right, I'm, gonna, I'm sounding like a mega fanboy here, but I needed to share my excitement. Um, cool swells here. I'm going to be using them a lot. The longs. I'm listening for the releases. Listen to the listen to that. Um, I, I stuffed up some of those earlier notes, which is why they sounded weird. I was moving my mod wheel too much, but. Listen to that room. It's beautiful. It has a great extension and depth, but uh, you'll notice the, the, the frequencies don't resonate too much in the low mids. I mean, this is not a great example. Let's go to horns. Let's go to horns. You can hear the extension of the sound, and then it, then it goes away in, the, in a pleasing way, which in a dense orchestral mix... Is exactly what we want. We want all of the beauty around the edges of the sound, is what I like to think of it. And and by the edges, I mean the the stereo uh, imaging, but also the front to depth back. There's there's like a frill on the edge of it. It's not just a a two D sound. This is three D gloriousness. Um, Now, obviously, Abbey Road 1's just like the taster. Like, there's no legato in this or anything like that. But personally, I'm not really too worried about that because I figure that's coming later down the line. Um, so, the, the my immediate sort of things that I'm looking at for me personally to fill in gaps in my template are the staccatos and all these other clever, uh, all these other fun articulations. The longs I'll probably get a bit of use out of. Um, but... Um, more so the staccatos. Let's listen to that. Same thing. Sorry if you can hear me bashing my keyboard here. I'm trying to limit that a little bit. Okay, so here's the battle that I have while trying to match this sound with other libraries. Because this sounds like the recordings to me of, you know, I've been just referencing Star Wars Episode 3 lately. This sounds a lot like that to me. Let me tell you why. There's distance there. The horns are obviously at the back. And Spitfire's done a good job of retaining the balances of their mics and things like that here. Because it's not sounding funky to me. Even when I'm playing multiple notes, this is usually a good giveaway for me. Even though an ensemble is recorded for each note, if I play a triad, it's so clean. The recordings are so clean that I'm not getting any congestion or build-up of frequencies that I normally would with sample libraries. Usually I have build-ups at around maybe 2.5k or in the low mids as well is probably the, even the more is the bigger build-up. And usually I find this is because... Um, possibly mics have been placed closer than what they traditionally would be for a film score recording and this uh, tends to throw off the whole balance of things a lot more than what a lot of developers probably realise but this feels legit to me this sounds legit once again really smooth dynamics lots of, uh, lots of nice range in the lower dynamics Sorry, keyboard uh, nastiness. And I'm just using mix one here. I mean, if we go into the mics, I've already had a listen. 
the close mics are not your standard close mics that are shoved right up the the whole of the instrument. These are these are going to give focus to to a, a nice room mic. And you never hear mics that are shoved right up an instrument in, in our favorite film scores. That never happens. So these close mics, although they're labeled close, I feel like they're not as close as what they have been in, in sample libraries in the past. And I'm very happy about that. It feels more like what... It sounds more like what my ears would expect it to. Um, so, and quite often, I would find myself in, in a... Um, in a mix for a, and you will hear this listen to star wars recording sometimes you hear brass especially trumpets you'll hear them just soaring over the top of the orchestra the, a lot of that is is our favorite mixes actually boosting these close they're called close but they're actually a bit further back more like section or mid kind of mics these are not mids these are a bit closer by the sound of it um but they're a good distance to get separation and to be able to have control, but not so close that it warps the sound and becomes something that's just totally different to uh, to the to the room mic. Uh, and and those mics are boosted all the time in your favorite recordings. A lot of people think they set up the mics and then just they go they walk away. No, these mics are super important if you want to um, really boost sections to be heard more. Uh, if you listen to Star Wars 3 end credits, listen to the beginning. The trumpets are really, really prominent at the beginning, yeah, at the top. And listen to the three-dimensionality of them. They're actually, they feel closer. They feel like they're just really loud as well. But then only like 30 seconds later, you hear them and you can hear the brassiness of the trumpets. They're still playing just as loud, but you hear them in their context of the room mic. So what I'm just trying to say is that the mics in this uh are, ama are well done and I'm excited to, to use them hopefully in a similar way to what the way that we hear them used in our fa favorite scores um, <clears throat> they've got uh, some other ones here which are really cool as well tree 2 I think is a bit closer which is use which is useful I think they've said here that, that it's better for a faster more detailed material I think the reason they're saying that is because the decay becomes a bit more controlled and the notes won't blur into each other so much Mix one is probably all that I would use most of the time, to be honest. It just sounds good out of the box. Once again, these articulations are really tight and nice. By the way, those little notes poking out are my... I want to blame it on my keyboard, but it's probably my playing more than anything. Um, all right, let's keep going. Let's keep going. I don't want to, I don't want to drag on for ages. <clears throat> so let's just quickly go through some woodwinds here. High woodwinds, same thing. Okay, that's amazing. In context, that's just going to be beautiful because they've got distance on them. They're not oh, so good. But in a lot of more modern mixes, you'll hear them feeling a little bit more present than that. Um, and that's easily obtainable here as well. Dial up the tree, but... Let's dial up those kind of section mics. Um, and even in some cases, you might want to dial down the tree a little bit. But what I love about this is these close mics. Can you still hear the dimension and the really nice stereo imaging in that? They're not just a mono mic that's been sort of... Th th these are... These are a collection of mics that have been cleverly already placed in the stereo image, which is what I've honestly spent a lot of time doing in my template. Uh, I, manu I usually manually have to do this by going into, you know, I manually map out my mic positions and manually EQ them differently and pan them differently. But this has already been done here very tastefully. It's not just a nasty, raw, close signal. This is perfect. This is perfect for being able to bring something into focus uh, in, in a pleasing, natural way. Um, so excited about this. The spill is actually also very useful. It helps give more of a bit of a spread to the sound so it doesn't sound so isolated compared to... So your horns don't feel like they're just in a narrow band of your image over here. Your trumpets don't feel like that. Although these these Decca recordings are so good that it's, this is probably not as necessary. But 
This provides a bit more spread and glue, I guess you could call it, to things as well, the spill. All right, let's keep going. Uh, low woods. Once again, uh, so many dynamic layers here. I don't know exactly how many there are, but there, I'm not noticing any issues. Let's, let's listen to the sustains here. Um... That's just perfect. I don't need to EQ that. <laughs> you know what? I'm actually a little bit annoyed. Because it means that people who haven't spent years dialing in their template like I have are going to instantly get better mixes. <laughs> Damn it! I've... Yeah, look. This has the depth and the dimension. And there's nothing, it's just, it's right. It's just right. I don't know what else to say. Uh, look, my favorite thing that I fiddled with, I've only briefly fiddled with this, by the way. But the, um, the percussion is amazing. Oh, we haven't even looked at strings. Let's have a look at strings. Let's just quickly go there. Um, strings are the thing I spend the most time on in my template. So I'm usually, I like to think that I'm pretty aware of how strings sound in mixes in my favorite recordings. I refer to Star Wars recordings a lot. I refer to a lot of John Powell mixes as well. Um, that's just a beautiful sound. And I'll just mix one as well. Let's hear the mics here. Tree. Wait for the samples to load a little bit. Let's listen to the close. Uh, strings, yeah, obviously we need legatos, but they're not here. But I'm going to get a lot of use out of... I'm going to get a lot of use out of these, uh, these other articulations, like... I probably would use the tremolos actually, but the spiccatos are definitely something that I would use. Um, where are they? And the pits, the pits are very nice too. Uh, and once again, if we need more focus on that sound, let's just dial in our own mix, bring more of those close mic sounds. Can you hear how that's now locked in more the positioning? And these close mics are done very well. They're not just... These close mics are actually done in context. So we don't... Even though they allow you the ability to go, to go over here and dial that in further, which I really do like, by the way, um, they've already been panned in a way that a real film scoring mixer would do it. Once again, no nasty, harsh, high frequencies in these close mics like there are in a lot of libraries. It's just going to bring more clarity to the imaging, which is exactly what they're supposed to do. Once again, you could dial down the tree a little bit. Ah, so many dynamics there as well. Um, beautiful stuff. Uh, what mics have I got loaded here? Yeah, mix one. Listen to that ring out. So good. It's large, but it's not soupy. Know what I'm saying? Once again, apologies for my... Uh, Apologies for my bashing. Let's go to percussion. I don't want to make this video long. I just, I needed to make it. I like spreading exciting products, exciting news to people. And this is exciting to me. Um, I've just been listening to Star Wars Episode 3. That sounds exactly like the bass drum. And you wouldn't believe how many hours I've spent trying to EQ and reverb and 
pan my <laughs> my currently existing libraries to sound like this. And there it is. Damn it, everyone's gonna be able to do this. Man, that's a very nice sound. That room is so good for percussion. Listen to it. No soup, just just largeness. Clarity. Uh, let's see what the close mics sound like on those. Let's see what they did. Cool. It's not just a mono mic. There's still plenty of sort of nice dimension there as well. Man, that's cool. That's really cool. All right, what else we got? Um, snares. Let's try snares. Which mix do we want? Let's just see what their mix sounds like. Uh, by the way, I find it very hard to find good snares. These are my new go-to snares. No surprise. Let's see uh, if I can get them to actually work first. Uh, by the way, there's some user error going on here. My bad. Oh. That's fine for an orchestral sort of perspective, but quite often the an orchestral mixer would boost like the overhead mics or like the closer mics on a snare. Now this is a big, big indicator to me of how much, well, listen to this. That's the snare sound you're used to hearing in mixes. That is amazing. That's not a snare up, that's not a mic up a snare's skin. That's those are mics that are have distance. Distance is so important on these focusing mics, and they're using multiple mics and here to give us dimension, which is just phenomenal. And you mix a bit of tree in with that. Uh, they they are the best snares I've heard. That's amazing. Oh, okay. What else we got here? Same here with piccolos. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. What else? I think we're nearly there, guys. Tuned. Oh, yes. Tuned, tuned, tuned. I'm not going to go through everything. But that's the sound. Except once again, quite often you'll hear more of a focused sound on these kind of percussion and tuned instruments in a, in in our favorite mixes, right? And I'm saying our favorite mixes, you know, assuming that everyone loves the sound of, you know, Star Wars and all that kind of stuff. Let's dial in our own mix here. I want a bit more focus on the hits. Let's hear what their close mics sound like. No harsh, nasty high frequencies or crazy high transients. Just focus. Perfect amount of dis distance. I, I can't say enough good things about how well, not only have they managed to somehow to, to get in the right room, they've recorded it exactly how it needed to, how it should have been recorded. And they've done so many dynamics. That will cut through your orchestral mix, but still be part of the bigness and part of the dimension. Oh, okay. I'm sounding like a fanboy. I've got to stop. No soup. That's all I'm going to say. I'm excited. If you're on the fence, I I, I mean, any, if you can afford it, 100% uh, I could recommend this library. And you can judge from my past videos. That's I don't I don't make these videos lightly, but I'm excited about this one. Have fun.